Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So as many of my regular viewers know, every now and again I do a five questions video where in the previous one people comment underneath and put their questions and in the next one I then answer five of those questions that appeal to me. It's been quite a long time since I did one of those, so what I've decided to do is for my Patreon um, supporters, I sometimes put up uh, unique uh, or different videos on the Patreon channel, and um, I put to them, uh, this was their chance to give me five questions, and I got lots of contributions, thank you very, very much, just generally to my Patreon supporters, but also thank you very much for the questions that came in. Some people posted multiple questions, obviously I can't answer them all, uh, however, some of them might feature in future videos that's so useful uh, ammunition for me to use when thinking about what to make in the future. And equally, some of these questions were things that actually would warrant their own video. Now, obviously, in this, I'm going to give you a bonus uh, question, so I'm going to do six questions and answers, um, picked out of the ones that I thought I could answer most concisely and that were potentially the most interesting as well. And that's not to say that I might not address those questions in future longer videos. And additionally, I may well, as I mentioned, ad address some of the other questions that I haven't answered uh, from, from those contributions in future videos as well. So, first up, from Ivan. Ivan says, um, in short, um, why did fingering the guard decline? Well, first of all, what is fingering the guard? It means sticking your index finger over the front quillon not quillion, a lot of people say quillion for some reason, uh, but uh, quillon, which comes from the French quillon, um, uh, the guard, so you've got a cross guard and it's got one, two quillons, and sticking the index finger over the quillon of the guard, and this is something we first see in probably the 14th century, uh, yeah, mid to late 14th century we start to see it, it's debatably you see it actually, yeah, thinking about it, you do see it very occasionally in earlier, uh, sort of 10th, 11th century Viking um, age, so Frankish, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Longobardic um, sources as well. So sticking the finger over the top guard is actually something that lots of people have been doing for a long time but it seems to have become more common in the 14th century and particularly 15th century and the result of this was that essentially finger rings were eventually developed to protect that finger when you were fingering the guard so to speak. And um, by the time of side swords in the 16th century, side swords and rapiers, um, it was completely normal to do that because it brings the point more online, gives you better point control, leverage in the bind, control, feeling in the bind, this kind of thing. Um, so it became very, very popular, in fact normal, I would say, fingering the guard in the 16th, 17th centuries. By the 18th century, the small sword started to develop. Now, the, this, this is a new small sword I have behind me. Um, the small sword did continue the tradition of having these finger rings, as you can see there. However, progressively, uh, throughout the development of the, of the small sword, at least in most places in France, England and Germany and Italy, the finger rings um, started getting smaller and smaller. And one of the reasons for that was because increasingly in small sword method, sticking the finger through the, qu uh, through the finger ring, or over the quillon essentially, wasn't really a thing that was done so much in later small sword. And one of the reasons for that is because um, with a cutting sword, the finger ring is in line with the cutting edge, but if you're no longer cutting with the sword, then very often you're holding the sword flat either that way or that way. And if you're holding the sword that way or that way, then it's not very comfortable to stick your finger through the finger ring. Additionally, if your sword gets grabbed or someone tries to do a disarm on you, your finger is now stuck to a finger ring and is quite likely to get broken or at the very least hurt quite um, nastily. So, but the main reason I would say, aside, aside from disarming, is that if you're holding a sword predominantly in cart or terse, flat like this, then actually sticking the finger through the uh, quillon is not ne really necessary. And additionally, the small sword is very light, and with a very light weapon, you don't really need that extra leverage that you would with a rapier, for example. A rapier is as heavy as a longsword, um, but with a weapon as light as this, which only weighs about 500 grams, you just don't need that extra uh, finger over the guard there. And you can actually get a more supple grip without sticking the finger over the, um, over the guard. And this type of grip, as we hold a foil essentially, started to develop, um, and you don't really use the finger rings anymore. So, they dropped out of use. However, they didn't entirely drop out of use. Um, if we look at some sabres from the 19th century, we start to see the finger rings sort of come back. 
Um, in, Port some, in Portugal there was a certain style of sabre that had essentially what's a finger ring, a bar, riveted to the underside of the sabre guard. And it has the same purpose as a finger ring. And in Austria and Germany, sometimes in Switzerland, sometimes they used a leather loop, um, again, underneath the guard. And that leather loop performed the same purpose. It was to give extra leverage and control, particularly a kind of flick, uh, extra leverage in the cut in that case. Uh, whereas with rapiers, it was more to control the point. Um, so there we go. Uh, the fing fingering the guard became less common because the stars of swords and swordsmanship changed essentially. But it didn't really disappear, and it was still in use in, with some sabers um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And in fact, there's a certain style of um, Italian foil which retained finger rings um, until very late and I believe in classical fencing it's still used and you could say that the, um, that the modern kind of pistol grip that you find on some fencing weapons is essentially again it's again it's kind of like fingering it's the same uh, mentality to fingering the guard so to speak so to cut a long story short um, I would say that fingering the guard didn't necessarily disappear um, but it became less common for specific reasons in specific cases. Right, on to the next question. Number two, what weapons would I travel with if I was travelling around in medieval Europe between the years of 1000 AD and 1400 AD? And that is from Matthew Jackson. Well, thank you for your question, Matthew, um, or Matt, whichever you're known as. Um, what weapons would I travel with? Well, you know, one of the things I've ranted about in previous videos was the fact that in role-playing games or computer games, uh, people load themselves up like a one-person armory and they wear their armor all the time and they carry a, a pole arm and perhaps a couple of swords and maybe a couple of missile weapons and they, ca they carry so many things you couldn't physically, realistically, in real life, carry that number of weapons around and you wouldn't want to and you wouldn't need to. Um, normal people in medieval Europe, when they were travelling, weren't expecting to get into war, okay? They weren't travelling to war, they were just trying to travel from one place to another, just like a modern person. Um, but you know, if you imagine you were travelling in a war-torn part of the world today, um, say, you know, some parts of, um, some parts of the Middle East or some parts of, um, uh, of Africa, um, some parts of Asia, then you wouldn't like carry several assault rifles and an RPG um, and wear body armor all the time and you know you wouldn't carry all in a string of grenades and all this kind of stuff so clearly the priority is to carry what's most effective and, and what you can carry and what's reasonable to carry so to cut a long story short I would um, carry one missile weapon uh, one sidearm and a backup of some kind. Um, yeah, you could, if you were traveling around, you could theoretically carry a, you know, a spear or a halberd or a bill or a, a really, you know, kind of a battlefield pole, pole arm, pole weapon. But really, realistically, would I? I think probably not. And I think that's probably the reason that um, quarterstaffs and staffs were so popular because it's something light and easy to carry around. It doesn't look too conspicuous. It doesn't make, make people look at you and think, why is that person carrying a battlefield weapon around? Um, so yeah, so perhaps a staff as well. But in terms of a missile weapon, it was certainly in England, it was fairly common to carry uh, a longbow around uh, in, in this period, in the medieval period. Um, and I think, you know, if you're traveling potentially with the aim of also feeding yourself and hunting, if you're not necessarily going to be in a place where, where you can buy food, um, then that's fairly important. If not, then would you bother carrying a bow? Oh, I don't know, maybe not. It depends on the scenario. But definitely a sidearm which would usually be a sword uh, and definitely some kind of knife knife or dagger so essentially it's not that surprising it's what most pe medieval people traveled with um, most medieval people traveled with usually a sword and a knife of one kind or another it could be a sword and buckler maybe or it might be a long sword or it might be some other kind of sword um, and usually not a large shield because they're a pain in the butt to carry around it's just not convenient gets in the way looks weird as well socially speaking and of course a knife and dagger because they've got all sorts of uses um, but if someone attacks you for example then very often a knife or a dagger is going to be more handy and quicker to get out than than a sword necessarily would be so there you go that's my answer possibly a ranged weapon like a bow or a crossbow definitely a sword 
uh, of some kind, perhaps sword and buckler, and definitely a knife or dagger of some kind. Um, so hope that answers that one. Right, so next question is number three by Vacuous Mermaid. And Vacuous Mermaid asks, how much did swords cost throughout history? I have sort of answered this in the past. Um, and essentially it depends on how, um, how much steel is mass produced in a given area. Now obviously if we're looking at something like the so-called Dark Ages, so the Anglo-Saxon Viking Frankish era, then swords really were only, um, only affordable by the, by the wealthiest people, um, by the, essentially what we would later come to call the gentry, the people who essentially are employers and landowners. Um, However, if we go later into the medieval period, um, if we go to the 14th and 15th century, swords were mass-produced by that point and really very common. And any type of soldier in the 14th or 15th century, unless they were some type of peasant levy, of which there actually weren't very much, certainly not in Western Europe anyway, um, unless there was some kind of, you know, forced to fight uh, levy, if they're any kind of, you know, willful soldier, they're going to be able to afford uh, sorry, willing soldier is what I meant, they're going to be able to afford a, a sword um, quite easily. I'm, I've given the famous example, or famous at least on this channel example, of um, the fact that archers, English archers, were paid six pence a day by the time of the Hundred Years' War, so 14th, 15th centuries, um, and six pence could uh, could just about buy you a rusty old sword. So looking through wills and indentures and stuff like that, you can find that there were swords valued as little as one or two pence if they were really, you know, rusty beaten up old things. And you could get really quite a nice sword for, for in the region of about 12 pence. So any kind of soldier really could afford a sword by, by the late Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. As we get into the, uh, the 16th and 17th centuries, that continues, it's even more the case in a way, um, and swords were really quite affordable, although of course there were, just like cars today, most people, or most people who have a job can afford a car of some kind, um, but they can't necessarily afford a Lamborghini. And it's exactly the same in the medieval or renaissance periods. You can't necessarily, uh, a, a common person, common soldier, um, couldn't necessarily afford the top end sword, but they could afford a sword, uh, you know, a functional one, one which would do the job. Um, uh, as we get into the 18th and 19th centuries, it's really a similar kind of thing. Uh, in, in the 19th century, anybody who wanted to could afford some kind of sword. Um, they weren't especially expensive, um, although it has to be said that um, officers' swords in the 19th century were, were fairly expensive, and although a, a labourer or factory worker could potentially save up enough money to afford one, it would be a big outlay for them for something that they didn't really need. Um, but, you know, if we look at the prices of swords and pistols in the 19th century, they were fairly attainable by most, by most working people in the population. So really, most parts of Europe in uh, most times after about the 13th century, swords were pretty affordable by most people, or a very big percentage of the population anyway. Before the, before the uh, 13th century, it gets progressively less the case, I would say in general. Um, and so if we go back to the, the Viking era, for example, so let's say the 8th to the 11th centuries, and if we go beyond, you know, earlier into the Migration era and then into the Roman era, and if we go all the way back to the Bronze Age, then swords, for the most part, were um, either provided by a ruler, um, so in the Roman period, of course, they were made by the government and provided to soldiers, um, but so they were either provided by the state or by your lord, or you had to be very wealthy to afford one for yourself. Right, on to question four. Um, Dominic Cerro Asturi asks, um, what were the effectiveness of different knightly weapons in armour, specifically the poleaxe, longsword and dagger? Well, this is a very complicated question and I looked, I read it, it was a fairly long and wordy question that was put to me. And I looked at it and I thought, hmm, I don't think I can film that in this video because I think it would be too long of an explanation. But actually what I can do is give a very short um, answer to the question, and that is different weapons are for different things, okay? Now, if you're fighting in armour and you say which is better out of a poleaxe and a longsword, generally the armour's a poleaxe. The poleaxe can do more than the longsword. However, 
There are certain weaknesses to a poleaxe and there are certain situations where you simply can't use a poleaxe. One example where a poleaxe becomes quite unusable is if someone manages to grab the shaft of your poleaxe and wrestle you. Now if someone's wrestling with you, a poleaxe doesn't, isn't hugely useful anymore. It's, it can be a lever, it can be something that you can es essentially wrestle back with um, that can assist maybe your, your, your own wrestling uh, counter to their wrestling. Um, but in that scenario where you're that close, a dagger might actually be better. There might be a moment in the fight where you think, hold on, I'm wrestling with someone here with a poleaxe. It would actually be better to just let go of this poleaxe um, and go straight for my rondel dagger, counter grapple them and start jamming my dagger into their um, visor slits or aventail or anywhere or armpits, anywhere we can find a gap to stick a dagger point into. Equally with the longsword, um, generally speaking, in a, in a, it, when the fight starts, the person who has a, a poleaxe has an advantage over the person with the longsword. But um, if we get into close range, again, if we get into almost wrestling distance, potentially the longsword might be better than the poleaxe because you can get your point to bear in close when you can't get the points of your poleaxe to bear in close because they're too far apart. Your weapon is six foot long instead of four foot long. So really it's about distance and range and the techniques that you're employing at a given time. Um, and so simply saying a poleaxe is better than a dagger doesn't really make any sense. Uh, because if I was fighting someone in a melee, in a, a, essentially a big scrum, a big group of people, a melee where we're all squished together like this, and I've got a poleaxe, or let's say a pike. Let's imagine an extreme example. If I'm holding a pike and all of my opponents are here, my pike is utterly useless, but that's also kind of almost true of the poleaxe. Yes, I can, I can use leverage, I can shove with the middle, I can try and hook and hit with the head, I can maybe stab into their lower armour with the, with, the, with the bottom spike on the poleaxe. But generally speaking, if I'm in this range, as I said before, it might be advantageous to go, hold on, screw the poleaxe, drop it and go for the dagger and start going bam, 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 bam in all the holes you can find. Um, and you've also then got a hand free to grab and grapple and do all this kind of stuff and create more openings for your dagger. So it's all about context. And I know I, I overuse that word, but it actually is, it, it's actually the answer. Um, so if you're fighting in armor, um, having a sword at your side and a dagger at your side and a poleaxe or a spear in your hands is the usual way of fighting in armour in the 15th century and 16th century as well. And there is a reason for this and that's because generally speaking you fight, you start a fight at, at long range but if you come in closer there might come a moment at which it's better to draw your sword and if you come even closer there very likely will come a point at which it's better to draw your dagger. And yes, in regards to your um, long question, in that lots of armoured fights would end in grappling. Um, simply because the armour prevents a lot of cuts and thrusts getting through to incapacitate you. Even if you're slightly wounded, you're not necessarily incapacitated. So um, yes, the dagger is an extremely important weapon in armoured fighting and it's no coincidence that rondel daggers first start to appear commonly on effigies and brasses, knightly effigies and brasses, at the same time that plate armour starts to become common. They're inextricably connected. So question number five comes from No Reply and No Reply says how was riding a horse not a death sentence? How was riding a horse into battle not a death sentence? Well, that's quite a large question, but clearly it wasn't. Um, and I guess the, the point that No Reply was making was that horses are large, squishy objects, and if you're sitting on the top of one, you seem to be a very obvious target for anybody with guns or bows, or um, if you come into hand-to-hand -hand combat against people with pikes and this kind of stuff. But it's all about context again. And Number one thing to say is that a horse is not easy to kill. Now, many of my regular viewers will know that I like to play Mountain Blade, and I usually play the Napoleonic Wars version. And one of the things that really annoys me, there's a few things, but one of the things that really annoys me about the Napoleonic Wars version of Mountain Blade, and you could say this about the other versions of Mountain Blade as well, the native version, um, is how easy horses are to kill. Horses are not that easy to kill. Um, that I have records of horses being shot with several arrows and still riding around and functioning for their riders. I have records of horses being shot by muskets and pistols 
um, more than two or three times, in some cases up to about five times, and still being compliant and still riding around and still being a useful thing. You, you, unless you shoot a horse in the head or the heart, they are large, sturdy, muscular lumps of meat. And anybody who's been around horses and been shoved by a horse or had their foot trodden on by a horse will tell you just how powerful a horse is. If you think you're strong, you're nothing compared to a horse, okay? Horses are far bigger than you, they've got a lot more muscle and meat in them than you, and bone, um, and they, they can squish you, quite simply. Um, and because they're larger, the weapons that we design to kill other humans aren't actually so effective at killing horses. Um, and, you know, if you want to kill a horse for, you know, reasons of, of um, putting it out of its misery or whatever, it's usually done either with drugs or a bolt gun to the head. Same with a, with a, with a cow. And the way that cows were traditionally um, killed in the medieval world was they were tied down to the ground and hit in the head with the blunt end of an axe, which gives us the name uh, Polax, incidentally. It's the pole, is the hammer side, or hammer on the other side of the axe. Um, and so yeah, so they are large, sturdy, strong animals, number one. They're not easy to kill. And even if they're wounded, they can still be useful as a, a cavalry um, conveyance, okay? The next point to make is that cavalry doesn't just blindly charge into hand-to-hand -hand combat with other soldiers. It's usually kept back and used at very specific moments in warfare. Number one, it might be hidden, okay? In the Wars of the Roses we see examples of this, and many, in Hundred Years we see examples as well, of where cavalry is hidden behind trees or behind a rise in the ground. So quite simply, they get to attack the opponent when the opponent's not expecting it, either in the flank or in the rear, or they attack the baggage train, or they attack artillery, you know, gunners, or people operating a trebuchet or whatever. Um, so this is one thing, using the element of surprise and speed. The next thing is, Cavalry doesn't usually, or shouldn't, just clash into another body of men and stand there slogging it out, like you can sometimes see happens in things like Rome Total War. In actual fact, cavalry should attack in and then break off, attack in and then break off, attack in, break off. Okay, so that's the next thing. Cavalry is extremely mobile. The next point to consider is in hand-to-hand -hand combat, a mounted man isn't only a mounted man sitting up high. They're sitting on a horse which is moving around. And it can be, you know, really difficult if a horse is moving around and turning and wheeling and maybe kicking, maybe biting if it's a trained war horse. Um, and the person on top of it is swinging a sword around or a war hammer or a lance, whatever they've got. Then it's actually quite difficult to get close enough to the person sitting up there to hit them. They're high up as well. Um, and the next point, the final point, I guess, that I want to mention, there are many, many points I could go on, but I'm trying to keep this concise, is that cavalry is very often used to attack a foe that is either already engaged with another enemy or is running away. That is, they're not fighting on equal terms, and that's how cavalry should often be used. Cavalry should be sent in to attack uh, infantry that are fighting other infantry, for example, or, uh, or indeed infantry that start to break and run away, uh, they may regather their forces and come back and be a threat again, but if they start to run away, that's the moment that you send the cavalry in and hit them at that moment as well, because of course the cavalry can cover a lot of distance very quickly. The final thing I want to mention is the horse itself is a weapon, as I've hinted at with the kicking and biting, but just simply riding over, it happens. And some modern riders will say, oh, I could, I could never get my horse to ride over a person. Um, you know, they'd just stop. Well, this is true of lots of modern riding horses because they're not the right type of horse and they're not trained the right way. But if you look at polo horses or police horses, you know, riot control horses, they will happily just ride into a group of people and knock them over like bowling pins. And um, I know one 19th century source that I have referred to in a number of videos where the cavalryman says, you know, I got wounded trying to kill this infantryman because I tried to hit him with my sword. Instead of remembering, I could have just bowled him over with my horse. Um, and this was the advice that they were giving to cavalrymen in the 19th century, is use the horse as the weapon. So, and obviously you don't ride your cavalry straight into a pike block. Who does that, okay? Instead you might attack the pike block in the flanks, you might engage the pike block with another pike block, and then hit them in the side with cavalry, or um, if they start to run away or regroup or reform, then you hit them with cavalry, this kind of thing. So cavalry is a highly, highly effective, and obviously for thousands of years was a highly effective and highly useful 
type type of um, soldiery, and you, but you have to use them at the right time and in the right place. If you use them in the right time, in the right place, in the right way, then they're extremely effective. Um, but of course, modern art artillery and rifles, bolt action rifles, and such like gradually made um, made cavalry more or less obsolete um, but you know cavalry was still being used to varying effect even in the second world war but in the first world war cavalry was used to great effect most famously under lawrence of arabia the the so-called arab revolt fighting against the turks um, in the middle east was extremely effective um, so uh, and and of course cavalry aren't only fighting from horseback they can be mobile infantry as well if you give them rifles they can dismount and shoot and mount up move off somewhere else dismount shoot mount up and move somewhere else so the mobility is highly important um, uh, so yeah so there's hopefully an answer to that question so the final question number six to wrap up and um, I'll try and keep this, again, I'll try and keep this as concise as possible. Frederick, I assume you're, it's Frederick or Friedrich, I don't know, um, asks, what movies or TV shows get it right or got it right? Um, now, Frederick, Frederick is asking, I believe, about both the fighting and the costume. I'm not going to answer the costume part of the question because that's, first of all, slightly out of my sphere of knowledge, but also potentially just too big to answer. Um, but in terms of fighting, I just wrote down some TV shows and movies that I like the fighting in. Okay, first of all, Vikings. I like the fighting in Vikings. Next up, The Three Musketeers um, and the sequels, the 1970s films uh, with, um, uh, with Michael York in and uh, Oliver Reed and so on. Um, Glory, film with Matthew Broderick, um, set during the US Civil War. Um, the Duelists. Um, Great film. Um, Rob Roy, another good film and same fight director as well, Bill Hobbs, um, chore choreographed the fighting in both The Duelists and Rob Roy. I like both of them. Serrano de Bergerac. Um, there are some actually really good French films. Don't ever shy away from watching foreign language films that might have um, fighting or swordsmanship in because some of them are really good. Um, I know there's some good Polish films out there as well but I haven't watched any of those yet. But Serrano de Bergerac has got some good fencing in it. Le Bossu, another example. I love the film Le Bossu and it's got some really, really nice rapier fencing in it and it's a great story to boot. Master and Commander. I love Master and Commander as a film. I love basically everything about that film, uh, but the fighting that's in it, which is there's not that much of it, but the fighting that there is of in it is, I think, superb. But more than the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the, um, the feel of what ship-to-ship -ship combat must have been like. Master and Commander, absolutely fantastic. Um, Last of the Mohicans. I, like, I, I love Last of the Mohicans as a film, and I think the, com the fighting in it is pretty good. Um, I have to say, the fighting in The Patriot, despite the fact that I hate The Patriot, and it's not just because I'm British, uh, and it's not just because the history is all wrong in it, um, but the fighting in it is actually quite good. Same thing, Braveheart. I have to say, Braveheart has got good fighting in it. It's historically bollocks, but the fighting in it, it looks like fighting. It's brutal, bloody, and it looks kind of, most of it looks like it makes sense. And finally, I've got to say, basically all Akira Kurosawa films. Seven Samurai, Hidden Fortress, uh, Yojimbo, and so on. Uh, obviously, fantastic um, choreography and martial arts shown in there. Right, so that's the end of my six questions. Thank you again to my um, Patreon supporters, and thank you for the questions. Under this video, feel free to post more questions you would like to see answered. And if you feel like supporting me on Patreon, then the link's below. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.